My mission and theme is simple. We all love the mountain gorilla. We all, when we look at these pictures, we are so inspired. And of course, if you see a mountain gorilla face to face, it's a life-changing experience. It's not something that I've just dreamt up. As a marketing slogan, David Attenborough has said that. Jane Goodall, of course, has talked about the chimpanzees. It is a very, very special experience, and I'm sure many of you in this room have seen pictures about it, heard about the Fosse story, or actually seen the gorillas. But my message tonight is simple. If you want to save the gorillas, focus on communities. And in a way, that's an interesting message because all day today we've had different examples of community issues. And that's the same in the middle of Africa. So the paradigm of gorilla conservation and tourism looks wonderful. It looks like a utopia, a magical landscape, an iconic species, local communities celebrating what looks like paradise. In reality, it's very complex, like all communities are. It's a fragile, tiny habitat. It's 700 square kilometers. To put that in perspective, the Serengeti, which of course is Africa's possibly best known park, is 30,000 square kilometers. And to put it in greater perspective, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is 70,000 square kilometers. So we're talking about a tiny habitat in the heart of Africa where Rwanda, Uganda, and the DRC meet. It is also amongst the poorest areas in the world. The communities in this area often earn less than $2 a day. So the economics, is, which is what this talk is about, is really, really important all the way through. And then population density is another issue. It's a very crowded area. It's six to 700 people per square kilometer. Now in Bend, I think, in certain parts, we'd be lucky to find one person a square kilometer. <laughs> The US average, of course, is 100 uh, people per square kilometer. And also this area has seen some of the greatest upheavals in Africa in the, uh, the post-colonial era, which finally ended about 20 years ago. The borders of Rwanda, Uganda, and the DRC are exactly where Africa meets, where the different communities of Africa meet, where the watershed meets, and where, of course, the different boundaries that were dreamt up in 1884 meet. So it's had tremendous change and upheaval. But luckily for all of us, about 20 years ago, it started to stabilize. And about 20 years ago, in a moment of madness, I thought it was time to go and build lodges in this area. So I don't know what quite happened, but it was partly because, of course, I was born in this area and I first saw this. Uh, I first saw the foothills of the Virungas, which you saw in the film, when I was a young boy about 50 years ago, when I walked in this area with my father. Um, so the gorillas are there, the forest is there, the tremendous magical landscape is there. But you know what, like I said before, the local communities have no intrinsic interest in the gorillas. They're an inconvenience. They need this land for cultivation. They need crops. They need to feed their kids. So how do you change the different elements of this paradigm? Well, tourism is one element which I'd like to discuss. But tourism brings money, but if you have too much tourism, it can cause stress and health issues for the gorillas. And Diane Fossey herself, actually, I'm sure you know, wasn't very keen on tourism because she thought the impact would be too negative. But in my opinion, if you have no tourism, I don't think the gorillas would survive. So let's look at a few elements of this story. As I said, I first saw this a very long time ago. And I gave up Africa. My family became refugees from Africa in the 1970s. And I went off to England and did other things. And then suddenly, uh, the Rwandese genocide just reminded me how fragile this area was, how complex it was, and how it was important to do something there. And that's what inspired, uh, inspired me to go back. Well, it wasn't, as I said, easy in all the middle of this conflict. But we started, we first started building a lodge in Gahinga in the late 90s, and then I built Virunga Lodge, which you, from which you see the views, in 2004. <clears throat> it was the first international lodge to be built after the Rwandese genocide. So the genocide, as you know, was in 1994, and by about 2000, the area started finally settling. And uh, that's when we really started working in this area. So my theme is that if you want the gorillas to survive, you need to make conservation 
part of an economic mainstream. And let's discuss the pros and cons of this issue. Because on the one hand, you have tremendous romantic ideals in many of us in this room, and best summarized by Ansel Adams, who is a great hero of mine, and as you know, who captured some of the most amazing wilderness areas of North America. And Ansel Adams said, wilderness is a religion, an intense philosophy, a dream of an ideal society. And these are tremendously powerful words that I'm sure have inspired many of us in this room, many of you who've come to live in this area because of wilderness. And these were the values that I was inspired to have by my father. Wilderness may be precious, but I don't think we can be romantic about it. In my opinion, it has to produce an economic return. Now, this might be controversial, especially in North America, especially given the recent debate about the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. I'm very conscious about, about the debate that says you can have oil or this pristine place, but not both. But is this, will, is this valid for wilderness in Africa, I ask, for the poor who live there? How are we going to feed them? How are they going to get economic benefit from what is happening in the world? They don't study flora and fauna. To them, it's an unthinkable luxury to go and see gorillas at $1,500 a pop. And governments, of course, need land to feed their poor. There's an increasing population, increasing development, increasing Western-style consumption. So I don't believe we can put wilderness and conservation on a pedestal when oil, minerals, logging can produce greater returns. We need to look at the relative benefits of these different things and the relative cost and the relatively neg relative negative consequences to find a balance. Otherwise, I think we're going to get problems because local communities will not support the gorillas in the future. At the moment, it's been a tremendous success story. The Ugandan government, the Rwandese government, the DRC government have made great efforts to stabilize the area, to look after these parks, to have rangers who protect the gorillas and the wildlife, and who have invested vast amounts of money to make sure we can all share the gorillas with the global community. And so they have done a lot in, cons in, in consultation with the conservation nonprofits. Many of them, as you know, are based in the US. So it's been a great success story. The mountain gorilla was possibly at 300 uh, in the 1960s, and now there are about 900. So it's been a great success story for the gorilla, but it's not going to be enough in the future. We need to find a way of making sure tourism and other sensitive industries can protect Africa's forests, put bread on the table, and give the children of Africa a chance to have an education and a better future. They too want the share of the growing wealth and health uh, and, and, and wealth of the world. And this is not some new thought. You know, sometimes you come to these very amazing places like TED, and there's a lot of thinking about what is new. Well, actually, most of life is often not new. It's looking at it again. Again, to take a US example, in the 1830s, which is almost two centuries ago, the American romantic painter, George Caitlin, champion national parks in the US, as you will know. And he talks about, talked about parks containing man and beast. Equally, John D. Rockefeller, who was very involved in setting up parks in this country, he said that every right implies a responsibility, every opportunity and obligation. These should be the values that should be central to working in, this, in, in, in these areas, to balance the different needs. Unfortunately, life doesn't seem to work quite like that. In the video that we showed, uh, there's a picture of the Batwa, Batwa community. The Batwa are the oldest inhabitants of Central Africa. They are our forefathers. These are the indigenous people of this area. And until 25 years ago, they lived um, in, the, in, in the volcanoes, in the national park. But when the national park was created, they were marched out at gunpoint and made conservation refugees. And this is a story, of course, that's happened again and again in different parts of the world, in North America and in Africa. And this is something we need to change. We need to respect our communities as much as we respect wildlife. I'm pleased to say that next month, we have made 
available land for the Batwa neighbors that we've had for the last 20 years to have a village of their own. Because for the last 20 years, they have lived landless and without rights and without any land or economic activity. So in May, they will have a village for 100 people and homes and somewhere where their children can play and hopefully they can move on with the ladder of life. And this is one of the great central themes that we have in our ecotourism model. And there are many in the world, and we should build on them, which involve the private sector, which involve public-private partnerships. So if we're, if we're to change the paradigm, there's your habitat, there's the wonderful landscape, there's the ranger taking you into the forest to see the gorilla, and which, of course, everybody wants to see. And this is the habitat. The forests of this area are unique. They're very, very special and very diverse. And this is the Batwa community that are getting ready their new homes together. And so if we look at how we put this together, historically, this is how we all perceive the issue, that in this pyramid, the gorillas are at the top of the pyramid. There's the ecosystem, of course, there's tourism, there's communities. But rather than have the gorillas at the top of the system, I would argue that we should have communities at the top of the system. And they will then look after the, the wildlife with us. Because that's what's very, very important, that they participate in this process as equals. They drive it. It should not be imposed on them. In closing, I would like to say two or three things. Each of you can make a difference, can think about plastic, can think about consumption. This continent still consumes vast amounts of, of things. The waste, the, the waste that we are producing in the industrial world is huge. We all need to think what we do about that. We all need to lobby our governments to support the disappearing forests, to protect ecosystems and, and diminishing species, but also, of course, to look after the communities. So I would argue, and this, would, this is meant to be provocative but not judgmental, that we should not do conservation, uh, we should not do conservation activities as private playgrounds for ourselves, for the privilege. We should not just do guerrilla tourism for entertainment, just for the privilege. We should do this to give the communities the freedom of life, the freedom to support the area around them. We need to bring them into the economic supply chain. And this is very, very central, I think, if we are to have these amazing ecosystems uh, survive, and also the gorillas in them. And I'm sure this can be done. The communities of Africa are some of the oldest in the world, and they have lived in partnership and harmony with their habitat more closely than we have managed, and we need to learn from them. In closing, I would just quote from Ibn Battuta, who some of you may know. Ibn Battuta was one of the earliest global explorers, and he was born in Morocco, and in the 14th century, he set up from Morocco and went to Asia and went to Europe, went to China, and he wrote in his famous book, Travel Meant for Him, Kinship with Humanity. And I think that should be the central message. If we remember, our, if we remember different people around the world, especially communities who are not as privileged as we are, I think we'd get more out of the protection of the ecosystem and the gorillas. Thank you very much. Thank you.